Number the Stars, Chapter 7, The House by the Sea. Oh, Anne-Marie, Ellen said with awe in her voice, it's beautiful. Anne-Marie looked around and nodded her head in agreement. The house and the meadows that surrounded it were so much a part of her childhood, a part of her life, that she didn't often look at them with fresh eyes. But now she did, seeing Ellen's pleasure, and it was true. They were beautiful. The little red-roofed farmhouse was very old. Its chimney crooked, and even the small, shuttered windows tilted at angles. A bird's nest, wispy with straw, was half hidden in the corner where the roof met the wall above a bedroom window. Nearby, a gnarled tree was still speckled with a few apples, now long past ripe. Mama and Kirsty had gone inside, but Anne-Marie and Ellen ran across the high-grassed meadow through the late wildflowers. From nowhere, a gray kitten appeared and ran beside them, pouncing here and there upon imagined mice, pausing to lick its paws, then darting off again. It pretended to ignore the girls, but looked back often to be certain that they were still there, apparently pleased to have playmates. The meadow ended at the sea, and the gray water licked there at the damp brown grass, personification, flattened by the wind and bordered by smooth, heavy stones. I have never been this close to the sea, Ellen said. Of course you have. You've been to the harbor in Copenhagen a million times. Ellen laughed. I mean the real sea, the way it is here, open like this, a whole world of water. Anne-Marie shook her head in amazement. To live in Denmark, a country surrounded by water, and to have never stood at its edge? Your parents are really city people, aren't they? Ellen nodded. My mother's afraid of the ocean, she said, laughing. She says it's too big for her and too cold. The girls sat on a rock and took off their shoes and socks. They tiptoed across the damp stones and let the water touch their feet. It was cold. They giggled and stepped back. Anne-Marie leaned down and picked up a brown leaf that had floated back and forth with the movement of the water. Look, she said, this leaf may have come from a tree in Sweden. It could have blown from a tree into the sea and floated all the way across. See over there, she said. See the land way across there? That's Sweden. Ellen cupped one hand over her eyes and looked across the water at the misty shoreline that was another country. It's not so very far, she said. Maybe, Amory suggested, standing over there, are two girls, just our age, looking across saying, that's Denmark. They squinted into the hazy distance, as if they might see Swedish children standing there and looking back, but it was too far. They saw only the hazy strip of land and two small boats bobbing up and down in the gray ruffles of the separating water. I wonder if one of those is your Uncle Henrik's boat, Ellen said. Maybe, I can't tell. They're too far away. Uncle Henrik's boat is named the Ingeborg, she told Ellen, for Mama. Ellen looked around. Does he keep it right here? Does he tie it up so that it won't float away? Amory laughed. Oh, no. In town at the harbor, there's a big dock, and all the fishing boats go and come from there. That's where they unload their fish. You should smell it. At night, they're all there, anchored in the harbor. Anne-Marie, Ellen, Mama's voice came across the meadow. The girls looked around and saw her waving to them. They turned, picked up their shoes, and began walking toward the house. The kitten, who had settled comfortably on the stony shore, rose immediately and followed them. I took Ellen down to show her the sea, Anne-Marie explained when they reached the place where Mama waited. She'd never been that close before. We started to wade, but it was too cold. I wish we had come in the summer so we could swim. It's cold even then, Mama said. She looked around. You didn't see anyone, did you? You didn't talk to anyone. Amory shook her head. Just the kitten. Ellen had picked it up, and it lay purring in her arms as she stroked its small head and talked to it softly. I meant to warn you. You must stay away from people while we're here. But there's no one around here, Anne-Marie reminded her. Even so, if you see anyone at all, even someone you know, one of Henrik's friends, it's better that you come in the house. It's too difficult, maybe even dangerous, to explain who Ellen is. Ellen looked up and bit her lip. There aren't soldiers here too, are there? 
Mama sighed. I'm afraid there are soldiers everywhere. Especially now. It's a bad time. Come in now and help me fix supper. Henrik will be home soon. Watch the step. It's loose. Do you know what I've done? I found enough apples for applesauce. Even though there's no sugar, the apples are sweet. Henrik will bring some fish, and there's wood for the fire. So tonight we will be warm and well fed. It's not a bad time then, Anne Marie told her. Not if there's applesauce. Ellen kissed the kitten's head and let it leap from her arms to the ground. It darted away and disappeared in the tall grass. They followed Mama into the house. That night, the girls dressed for bed in the small upstairs bedroom they were sharing, the same bedroom that had been Mama's when she was a little girl. Across the hall, Kirsty was already asleep in the wide bed that had once belonged to Amory's grandparents. Ellen touched her neck after she had put on Amory's flower-sprigged nightgown, which Mama had packed. Where's my necklace? she asked. What did you do with it? I hid it in a safe place, Emery told her. A very secret place. No one will ever find it, and I will keep it there for you until it's safe for you to wear again. Ellen nodded. Papa gave it to me when I was very small, she explained. She sat down on the edge of the old bed and ran her fingers along the handmade quilt that covered it. The flowers and birds faded now, and they had been stitched onto the quilt by Emery's great-grandmother many years before. I wish I knew where my parents were, Ellen said in a small voice as she outlined one of the applique birds with her finger. Amory didn't have an answer for her. She patted Ellen's hand and they sat together silently. Through the window, they could see a thin round slice of moon that had appeared through the clouds against the pale sky. The Scandinavian night was not very dark yet, though soon, when winter came, the night would be not only dark, but for very long, but very long night skies beginning in the late afternoon and lasting through morning. From downstairs, they could hear Mama's voice and Uncle Henrik talking, catching up on news. Mama kissed her brother when she hadn't seen him for a while, Anne Marie knew. They were very close. Mama always teased him gently for not marrying. She asked him, laughing, when they were together, whether he had found a good wife yet one who would keep his house tidier. And Henrik teased back and told Mama that she should come to Gillilahay to live again so that he wouldn't have to do all the chores by himself. For a moment, to Anne-Marie listening, it seemed like all the other earlier times, the happy times, the happy visits to the farm in the past with summer daylight extending beyond bedtime, with the children tucked away in the bedrooms and the grown-ups downstairs talking. But there was a difference. In the earlier times, she had always overheard laughter. Tonight, there was no laughter at all.